Um, I'm really happy to be here because uh, being here and being able to talk to you means that we, um, we finished uh, the work that we've, been, that we've been working on for, for four years. So for four years, we've been working on making our iNode technology available for your language, for Japanese. It's been a close collaboration between the, the, the iNode team in Belgium, the iNode team in the, the United States, and also the, the Japan office. And the last year, we've also been working very closely with a couple of uh, people here in the room uh, from our partner and customer community um, to, to make it here and to be able to announce to you the availability of the Aino language model for Japanese. So what I'll be talking to you about is why we developed Aino, who we're developing it for, and what are the, the sorts of things that we, that we do with our technology. And then afterwards, Horita san will give, a, will give a brief demo, but he'll be going into more detail, taking you through things during his session in the, in the afternoon. So I'd first like to show you the people we work for. You've, uh, you've seen the, the person, the, the white-haired gentleman in the video that we saw at the beginning of, uh, of this morning program. Uh, but the people that we work for, um, in reality, whom we build software for, are knowledge professionals are people that work with, with, with knowledge they have, with knowledge they've gathered over the years, and that have to make decisions based on that knowledge. So it's researchers, it's clinicians, it's lawyers, it's, it's analysts in the financial industry. People that can do a better job if they know more. People that need to learn while they're on the job, continuously consume information in order to know more and make better, well-informed decisions. So, they're all about knowledge, so their entire business is around knowing things. And for a clinician, that means talking to, talking to his, his patients. For people in the, in the retail industry or producing consumer goods, it means listening to their customers. For people in the legal industry, it means talking to their clients, reading legislation. So all these people need to be able to constantly consume new information that becomes available in order to do a better job. Now, software is there to help, obviously. S software tries to help people consume large amounts of information more easily. It tries to help them what used to be like a, a, a 30,000 table, a 30,000 record table of information of, for example, stock market quotes, to visualize that in a way that, that they can easily consume it, that they can e easily see whether there's a particular trend that they can or should exploit in investment. Or for a clinician, it could be, it could be a plot of a, a patient's body temperature over time that could tell him something, something interesting or something that helps him make a decision. So technology can help knowledge professionals in being more professional, in doing more with that, with that, that knowledge that they have. Unfortunately, not all data is as easily aggregated. So you can aggregate stock market uh, information easily in a chart. You can, you can easily kind of visualize certain lab results. Uh, you, can, you can visualize uh, sales information in a dashboard, but you cannot summarize text that easily. You cannot take the average value of a patient's history, of what a patient has been telling you over the last few years. You cannot find the minimum or maximum value of, of legislation or precedent in a legal scenario. So text is hard. So what we are trying to do with our technology is making text less hard, making it easy for you to consume text in a quantified manner so that you can use these business intelligence-like dashboards and these other uh, advanced analytics technologies to consume these large amounts of data and put them all together in a comprehensive report that does summarize potentially very large volumes of textual data. That is what I know is about. So let's, let, let's take a look at what that really means. So I'd like to start with this, this example. So this is a news article that I found on the web a couple of weeks ago, which talks about the Bank of Japan and the effect of a certain announcement made by the Federal Reserve, the Fed, the American National, National Bank. So how can we summarize this? How can we quantify this sentence in such a way that we can aggregate that information if we would have not just one sentence, but 1,000 or 1 million sentences. The classic way, at least in Western languages, we'll get to Japanese, 
um, is to cut sentences up into words because you have spaces so you can simply look at all the individual words and then put them in alphabetical order, add up their frequency, the number of times they occur, and this gives you kind of a, a summary, a formal representation of the sentence that you could easily aggregate. If you have not one, but 1,000 sentences, you just add up the numbers for every word, and you would expect that the words that appear most frequently to drift to the top of this list. Now, unfortunately, there's a few problems with this, because this formal representation could just as well have been the formal representation of a completely different sentence. So this sentence no longer talks about the Bank of Japan. It no longer talks about the Federal Reserve. We no longer know who made the announcement. So clearly that approach of cutting a text up into individual words is not good enough. It doesn't keep the context that is vital. It no longer keeps track of the actual entities that the author of the text was talking about. So we need something better. We need smarter software. We need smarter solutions. Ideally, what we would like to have is a technology that allows us to identify the entities that the author talked about. So the author of this sentence talked about the Bank of Japan, the Fed announcement, talks about world stocks. So rather than this representation, we'd rather have something along these lines. So that lists the true concepts that the sentence is talking about one that lists the context of those concepts. So how do they relate to one another? So this is what text technology, what natural language processing should really try to achieve. So let's take a look at how you can, how you can try and get there. We'll first look at how a classic top-down approach, so not I knows, but like the classic uh, technologies in the market would approach this problem. We'll start from a, a slightly shorter sentence to make it fit on the screen. The, in this sentence um, is also about a, a recent news article. So EpiPen is a medication for people who have uh, potentially severe allergy attacks. And that medication's price was almost doubled for no apparent reason recently. And the CEO of the company that sells EpiPen had to go and explain herself in front of a congressional hearing in the United States for United States Congress. So how do we try and find the entities that this sentence is talking about. So classic approaches will first cut up the sentence into word groups of length one, then all the possible word groups of length two, word groups of length three, four, five, six. So depending on the language, that can go up to eight or 10. And then the goal of these technologies is to try and find the ones that matter. What are the, the entities, the word groups that are really the ones that the author was talking about, so congressional hearing and EpiPen price hikes. Now this is hard, because you need to know a thing or two about the US politics or the US political system in order to know that congressional and hearing can belong together. You need to know a little bit about pharmaceutical industry in order to know that EpiPen is actually a pharmaceutical product that has a price and therefore can have a price hike. So, you really need to have extensive knowledge of the domain that your tool will be working in in order for you to be able to, to do this work, to identify these elements. And this isn't, it, it's not just domain, the domain specificness that's making it hard, it's also the fact that there are, there are possibly evolutions in there. So new people get born every day, so new names may pop up in news articles. Uh, new products get invented every day. New companies are founded every day. So your dictionaries that you use for this top-down approach, they need to evolve over time. They need to be maintained, and that is a very costly process. So how does I know go about, go about this? So what we are exploiting is, a, is an interesting phenomenon in, 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 in languages that we can also see kind of in the world in general. Take, for example, food. There are thousands of types of food, and I've had uh, the chance of uh, savoring a few here in Japan. Um, there's thousands of types of food, but there's only so many things you can do with food. How can you relate to food? You can eat food, you can like food, you can buy food, you can prepare food, but there's not that, ma that many more. There's not a thousand ways how you can interact with food. So that applies to, to language as well. 
So these things, these concepts, that congressional hearing, those EpiPen price hikes, there's very many things that could be expressed in these entities. But there's only very few ways how they can relate to one another, how they can have a particular role in a sentence. And that's exactly what Ino tries to exploit. So rather than do the, the hard work, the computationally heavy thing of trying to identify the entity pieces, the concept pieces, we try to find everything else. Because those elements, they are, they are far fewer in number. And also, they are universal across industries. If you hear a clinician talk, or a lawyer talk, or a researcher talk, they talk about different things. But they use the same language. They use the same relational elements that link these entities together. And that's the thing that I know exploits. So we will try to identify these non-concept syntactic elements of the sentence. Because that's, that's part of the grammar of language. Obviously, we're not there yet. So we found all the ones that are could eventually be in a non-concept role. But as you can see, more than half of our sentence could be in a non-concept role. So that's where our, our smart linguistic engine kicks in and, adds, uh, and, and goes through a set of syntactic rules to disambiguate all of the possible, all of the potential words until we find out what are the actual non-concepts. So in this case, there's a, a relationship. And then by definition, everything that is not a non-concept is a concept. Obviously, there's a lot of, there's a lot of complexity in, in how we build our rules, but that's not a problem for you because we do that automatically. And then we capture context, we, uh, we make a few calculations that really kind of preserve that concept, context and now allow you to aggregate the information over time. So this is what Ino does. So rather than from a top-down perspective, from an I know everything about this domain and I'm going to recognize it in the sentence perspective, um, Ino is taking a top-down approach. We know everything about the language that you are using, the language that is universal among humans. And we're going to exploit that. So that's obviously just giving us concepts and, and a little bit of context. So how can you really use that in real applications? So the first typical use case that we, uh, that we propose when we, when we go to customers is text exploration. So when a customer, uh, for example, when a, when a clinician has a, has a patient that's going to walk in in the next, uh, the next minute or so, and he needs to uh, he needs to kind of stand in for, for one of his colleagues who had, seen that, had been seeing that patient for like 10 years. He has no time whatsoever to read through 10 years of notes on that patient. But he may have time to just quickly see what are the top concepts, the top entities that were brought up in conversations with this patient. And if I, if I select one of those, what is related with it? Or what are the variations of it that the author, I, that the, my, my colleague clinician, actually used when he was describing the, the situation of this patient. So that text exploration uh, capability, for example, in an electronic medical records context, is a, is a scenario that we've implemented around the world. The next one, trend analysis, is about using the information that I know gives you and pairing that up with structured information, trying to find correlations. For example, still in that clinical scenario, is there an evolution over time in the, the delusions, the, the, the delusion-related concept that I see in my patient history? So that I could, for example, try to identify if there may have been a particular incident that triggered all this. So that's trend analysis. And then a third is information extraction. It's trying to identify very specific pieces of structured information that were mentioned in the free text uh, and make those available as structured inputs for analytics, for workflow, or for example, for more advanced machine learning algorithms. So all of that is purely bottom-up, is exploiting the language and nothing but the language. So this, all of, uh, almost all of these implementations would be the same for a lawyer, for a clinician, for a researcher, for a financial analyst. But if you do have some knowledge about your domain, then why not use it? If you're looking at this, 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 this ex exploration capability that gives you, every I, gives you all the top concepts for a patient's medical history, and if you know 
a list of medications and if you know a list of, of symptoms, you can flag those entities and kind of put them in separate lists or allow you to kind of uh, drill down into exactly that subtype. So I already mentioned that that top-down approach has its, it has its problems. But the main problems of that top-down approach were that it's computationally complex to start with the top-down approach and to make sure that you aren't missing anything that the person who wrote the dictionary didn't know about. Whereas if you first do the bottom-up piece and you know what the author is talking about and then pair that up with your domain knowledge, that gives you a very powerful combination. And why is it especially important to pair those up? Because the bottom-up information, the entities that we found out from the language structure of the sentence can tell you whether you, are, whether you have a complete match with your dictionary or only a partial match. For example, if you're a veterinarian and you want to look up uh, anything related to dogs, but if you find something in your text that talks about hot dogs, well, the entity will be hot dogs. So that's only a partial match. So you can't really trust that without looking that that is the same as, a, as your full match. So the combination of bottom-up and top-down is, is a very powerful one. So now let me go into a little more detail on how this really works for Japanese. Because it may sound straightforward for English, but uh, for, for Japanese, we've, um, we've tried to kind of emulate the same idea. So I will not try to read this sentence aloud, but it is one we took from a scientific news article about dentistry. And we'll, uh, we'll see how you can identify the entities in this sort of sentence. So for Japanese, there have been morphological analysis tools around for, for years, like Makeup and Juman, that allow you to identify words, identify the smallest pieces that have uh, a particular meaning on their own, or that have a certain grammatical role, or that imply a grammatical role for other parts of the sentence. So, for example here, this individual character means teeth, this character means marrow, and this character means cell. But if you pull them together, that means something slightly more specific than these individual things. So, if you are just summarizing your sentence using this formal representation that contains all of, the, of those little tiny units that were identified through morphological analysis, we're again losing a lot of context. Because this could have been the, the representation of a completely different sentence. Whereas it still may look like a, a valid scientific uh, article sentence. If I would be the researcher who wrote the sentence at the top, I would be really disappointed if people are thinking that I actually wrote this. Because it's about a completely different sort of research or, or exercise. So how does I know go about this? How does I know approach this very same sentence? So rather than trying to identify these very small pieces, we try to identify the entities in their entirety, the entities that the sentence really talks about, where, where the meaning is implied by the sentence, and where we, can, where we can find the boundaries of these entities by using the same grammatical ideas that we, that we use for other languages. So rather than going through that lengthy list of, of all possible small units, we like to represent the sentence with these entities as identified by Aino. So step by step, let's take a closer look at how this works. So again, we will not look for the entities themselves because that is a computationally intensive task. We will look for the non-concept syntactic elements, the particles, the ambiguous cases, the characters that can have uh, a concept or a non-concept role. And then we will apply the smart uh, the advanced grammatical rules to disambiguate those cases, to say, okay, if this appears in this particular context and is followed by that, then that means that it's most probably in, on the concept side or it's on the non-concept side, until we've gone through our set of rules and end up with a nice sequence of entities. Then we'll calculate a couple of metrics that express the relevance and, uh, of individual entities and that express how they relate to one another, just like we did for other languages. So this is, it. This is actually how we applied the general idea of Aino to the Japanese language. And we saw that there as well. There's, a, there's, there's strong grammar in Japanese that we were able to exploit to achieve this 
this uh, kind of representation of sentences. Now let's take a look at a couple of use cases that we've, uh, that we've implemented around the world. First, patient cohort selection. Patient cohort selection is about selecting a group of patients. So I want to, for example, find out if there are in my hospital a number of patients that are eligible for a particular clinical treatment, for a particular, uh, for a particular treatment. Or I could try, if I'm, if I'm in a pharmaceutical industry, I could kind of ask hospitals, do you have patients that would be good candidates for this particular new medication that I'm trying to develop. So for that scenario, you would be describing certain factors that are important, certain selection criteria that are important to, uh, to, to include or exclude patients from your cohort. Now, there are obviously uh, criteria like a patient's age or, the, or gender or certain reimbursable diagnosis codes that you can easily find in the structured pieces of, the, of your data. But there will always be these things for which they forgot to include a column in the patient table. For example, we've been contributing to research to hep uh, into hepatitis C and there a couple of known risk factors are having been to prison or having a tattoo. But I don't expect, if I go to an electronic medical record system, I don't expect to, have to see a tattoo column there in the patient table. So that information needs to come from the unstructured side because it may well be present there. And I know gave our partners and our customers the ability to accurately select that and not make the dogs versus hot dogs mistake. Because we know the entire entities as they were meant by the authors. A second use case that we've uh, implemented together with a partner in the financial industry is about regulatory compliance. So our partner was helping investment bankers in meeting their regulations. So when you are an investment bank banker and you, you get a, a bag of money, you typically get a pile of paper with that. And in that paper is a description of what you are allowed to do with the money. Um, where rules saying that you can buy this and this and this particular financial in instrument and you're only allowed to buy this or this one if you also satisfy this and this criteria. So there's a lot of complex rules that are written in text, that are written in text written by lawyers, which would be very helpful if, they if these rules would be enforced automatically in your trading system. So if you're about to kind of make a trade that is non-compliant, that there is a warning light that starts flashing that prevents you from going out of policy and perhaps facing, uh, facing charges or facing uh, prosecution. So what we helped the customer with was leverage iNo to very accurately identify these rule templates, the, the, the sort of sequences of, of, of elements that could identify an investment rule and that allowed them to go much more quickly, many orders of magnitudes more quickly through the, these large piles of paper. And then a third use case that I'd like to briefly touch upon is one that is uh, implemented here by, uh, by Datacube, um, which is uh, a very nice exploratory interface to, to kind of observe information that is associated with your patient records. So this is, um, this graph shows you the evolution or trends of the use of terms. Uh, in pink, I have influenza. In yellow, I have influenza antibodies. And in green, I have influenza vaccine. And what you can see clearly is that the vaccine season, or that, that people start talking about vaccines before the actual influenza season starts. So you have to, obviously, this is kind of February, and then March starts there again. Um, so here, because I know looked at the entities and not at the individual words, we can make that distinction and we can very accurate, ac accurately say that I see how the vaccine period is, uh, is kind of building up towards the, towards the actual influenza season. So that's another very nice uh, example of uh, where one of our partners here in Japan has taken advantage of, uh, of INO for presenting to their customers. And now I'd like to pass the floor to Horita-san, who will take you through a demonstration of the technology. Ah, 
おはようございます。インターシステムジャパンの堀田と申します。本日はあの私アイノの技術セッションということで午後担当しておりますけれども、あのこの時間あの5分弱あ5分強ぐらい借りましてですね、あのベンジャミンの申し上げたことをまあより理解していただくためにデモをさせていただきたいと思います。あのあちょっと画面を大きくさせていただきます。でここをあのご覧いただいて、あであの題材としてはです、ね、あのウェブの、まあ、ニュースのサイトで、えー、1ヶ月ほどの、ここ1ヶ月ほどのデータを、えー、使いまして、ああいうのを使って分析をしております。であのまあ、全くその辞書とかです、ね、その知識とか、そういう処理はせずに、まあ、ほとんどそのああいうのの元からある機能を使ったデモでございます。でまずあの左側に表示されておりますのが、まあ、いわゆる、えーベンジャミンがご説明しておりましたエンティティというものでございますけれども、まあ、あの上の方をご覧いただきますとです、ね、まあ、携帯素解析と同じ単語じゃないかと、まあ、思われるかもしれませんが、例えばこの、ここですね、安倍総理大臣という部分は、これ、おそらくまあ携帯素で,で、特にその総理大臣の名前をです、ねまあ、知らなければです、ね、おそらくまあ何かの形で分かれて、処理されると思いますけれども、まあ、事前の知識なしに安倍総理大臣という言葉が切り出されております。そしてあの下の方にはですね、えー、例えばこの元のニュースのソースで、アイノーがどういうふうに、えー、エンティティを切り出しているかというところが、えー、見てご覧いただけます。青い部分がベンジャミンがご説明しましたエンティティ、まあ、つまり意味のある、まあ、単語の羅列とまあ、ここをパッと見ていただいてもです、ね、例えばアウン・サン・スー・チー国家顧問とかです、ねまあ、この辺りミャンマーの政権だとか、まあ、こういうところっていうのはなかなかその携帯層でもちろんあの処理をしてくっつけることはできるとは思いますけども、えー、何もない状態でここをさっとこう、えー、エンティティとして抽出できるというのが、まあ、ベンジャミンが申し上げていたアイノーの、えー、エンティティという。えー意味をできるだけ失わないように、えー、言葉を、えー、抽出していくということの例でございます。でそうして抽出したエンティティの,、まあ、あの頻度等がです、ね、ここに数値的に表示されておりますけれども、まあ、これだけでは、えー、まだ、えー、少し機能的に足りないので、この類似エンティティというのが真ん中に表示されております。これも I の,の元からある機能でえー、ここのでいう類似というのは、まあ、いわゆる字面テキスト的にあの似ているというところで、えー、判別をしておりまして、えー、ご覧いただきますとです、ね、例えば安倍総理大臣の所,所信表明演説これも、えー、一つのエンティティでございますで、まあ、おそらくこの1か月の間に国会等で所信表明演説をしたというニュースがあったということを、まあ、示している。まあ、今後のの政権運営とといいうのもございますあと、まあ、少しあの変わったところというか、昭恵夫人という言葉も一緒に出てきておりまして、まあ、これももちろんほとんどの皆さんご承知だと思いますけれども、もし、えー、知らない、えー、知らない方がいらっしゃったらです、ね、あ奥様は昭恵さんとおっしゃるんだという、ここでまあいわゆるその発見型のです、ね、言葉の抽出が、えーまあ、いわゆるそのナビゲーション、エクスプロレーションという言葉がございましたけれども、えー、という形で、えーまあ、新しい知識として皆様の、えー、知識となるというようなご説明でございます。でもう一つ、えー、例をです、ね、挙げさせていただきますと、まあ、あの今日ですね、米国から、あのえーゲストも来ておりますので、なかなかその取り上げるのも、あのちょっとあの、内容的にはあのトランプ氏というあのあのエンティティをここで切り出しておりますけれども、まあ、トランプ氏、まあ、ご承知の通りあり、アメリカの大統領の,あの選の、えー、候補でございますけれども、ここでちょっとあの見ていただきたいのは、今度はその3つ目の、えー箱ですねでここにはあのプロキシミ、まあ、近接性と書いてございますけれども、そのアイノーがエンティティを抽出して、そのエンティティのまのつながり具合といいますか、その並び方を分析して、いかにそのあるエンティティが別のエンティティと近いかというところを計算して持っております。これもあの特に皆様、何もする必要がなくて、アイノーが今、計算をしているものを出しているんですけれども、まあ、一番上に出ておりますのが、
まあ、クリントン氏ということで、まあ、もうご承知のように対立の候補でございます。でまあ、2番目、まあ、これも、まあ、いわゆるコントラバーシャルな話ですけども、まあ、女性というエンティティが出ておりまして、まあ、多くは申しませんけども、まあ、あのご入手でご承知の方であればですね、えー、どういう話でこれがつながっているかというのは分かると思うんですが、まあ、これもですねもし皆様がこのニュースにあまり詳しくなかった場合にこれなんでこういうものが出てるんだろうということで、えー、まあクリックしてこう何か。えー、辿っていていただくとあそういうあの、まあ、背景があるんだなというような知識が得られると、まあ、これも一つの探索の例かと思います。で以上はあの全くそのアイノーに対して辞書を、えー、入れずにやった例なんですけどももう一つですねあのベンジャミンの説明からもございましたようにやはり、まあ、とはいえこうやって切ったものをさらに、えー、詳しく見ていくためにはそのドメインの知識ですねその、まあ、例えば医療の業界で言えば病名のコード薬剤のコード等もございますし、まあ、金融業界さんであれば会社の名前と証券コードの対応とか、まあ、そういう知識がありますからそういうものを辞書で持つことができます。で今日はそこまで、えーハードなハードというか決まった辞書ではないですが、えーまあ、ざっくりそのトピックを分類していこうという目標で目的で辞書をいくつか用意しておりまして例えば東京に関することで例えば東京そのもの、えー、東京東京都東京都内、まあ、いろんなバリエーションがあると思いますけどこれまあ全部東京ですよねとかですねであと、まあ、東京オリンピックという言葉がありますので、まあ、例えばオリンピックオリンピックとパラリンピックが同時に出ますのでオリンピック・パラリンピックあとオリンピックという言葉は出てませんけど4年後の東京大会、まあ、これもオリンピックの話ですよねということでこれは東京オリンピックというジャンルというか、まあ、トピックとして、えー、まとめるというような辞書を与えておりますで、まあ、その他鳥取であるとか熊本であるとかあとスポーツですねスポーツだとまあ野球サッカーオリンピックというような話題もまあ事前にいくつかのエンティティまあ、これももちろんあのあいうのを使って発見的にどんどん追加していただくっていうイメージにはなりますけどもえまあいくつかのえまあ知識ですね分類を大まかなトピックをえ与えてあげてであのさらに先ほどと似た画面なんですけども少し違うなこの右下の部分でえまあ大体ここはあのニュース記事が今回3300件ぐらいございますけどもそのうちまあ5500っていうのはトピックはあのオーバーラップしますので。5500ぐらいのトピックがあると、まあ、ざっと見ていただくと東京とかあと災害スポーツ、まあ、大体どういうバランスで出てるのかっていうのはご覧いただけますし例えば安倍総理大臣というエンティティが出ている分の中でトピックがどういうふうに分布しているのかと今フィルター安倍総理大臣というところでフィルターいわゆる限定するっていうボタンを押すと右下が。あの変わったと思うんですがもちろん安倍総理大臣ですから、まあ、国会がまあほとんど大きいですねと、まあ、東京と国会入れ替わりましたあと鳥取はまああのここの箱からはなくなりましたけども、まあ、これはまあご承知の通りあり地震はございましたけどもおそらく総理大臣はまだ行かれて,も行かれてないですからあのニュースではあのまあトピックとしてはかぶってないというようなことがここでえ分かると思います。でもう一つですねこのフィルターっていうのはあの時系列であのフィルターすることもできますので例えばあですいませんそうですね、えー、例えばまあ9月13日ぐらいから10月の10日ぐらいまでこのレンジで分析をやりますというようなフィルターをしたらですね、まあ、ここが変わって。まあ、鳥取というポーション、まあ、あの消えてはないですけども非常にまあ小さくなってこれはあのまあご承知の通り地震が起きる前のことでございますので、まあ、ニュースのバランスとしてはえこういうふうな変化があるでこれをまあ応用していただくといわゆるトレンド分析ですね、まあ、さっきの,あのインフルエンザの話もございましたけども時間の中でどういうふうなエンティティの出現がの変化があるかというようなえことがえこういう形で分かり分か,る分かりやすいというようなデモでございます。でまあ,あのこの一つ一つの記事の内容をこうクリックするとその記事がどういう、まあ、このちょっと東京が黒くてあの色があまり良くないんですけどもこの一つの記事について、まあ、赤で示しているスポーツと、まあ、黒の東京というのがトピックとして現れてますという、まあ、箱が。でこれ実はあのパーシャルマッチと部分マッチも含めてここに表示しておりましてじゃあこの
、えー、トピックですねこの記,記事のトピックは何についてかっていうのをさっきの分類したトピックで見せると、まあ、東京がメインで、まあ、スポーツの話題もありますとでスポーツについてはオリンピックの話題ですというようなあのことが分かりますのであの最初にお見せしたエンティティそして関連性というようなものを、えー、後から辞書ということで少し整理した形で、えー、見せてあげるとこういったような、えー、まあ皆さんももちろんあの今はニュースあのご承知の大体有名なニュースばかりをご紹介しましたけどももしかすると、えー、皆様知らなかった情報がこういう形でまあ容易にですね、えー、知ることができるというのが、まあ、愛能の、えー、コアの考え方で、まあ、ベンジャミンがずっと説明してきたことでございます。であの最後にあの重要なことですけどもあのこれはあのいわゆるディープシートと同じでキャセのいわゆる埋め込みの技術埋めキャセを埋め込みの,あのキャセに埋め込みの技術としてご提供いたしますので、まあ、これもあくまでもデモでございますし、えーもちろんこれをベースにここからスタートスタートラインとしてはここからスタートをしてここにいらっしゃるパートナー様のいわゆるクリエイティブなアイディアもしくはエンドユーザー様のクリあー、まあ、ニーズですねこういうことがしたいとかそういうことに合わせてここからいわゆる API を使って組み上げていただくというのがアイノの考え方でございますでもちろんあのベンジャミンが説明しました携帯素解析っていうのも私どもは否定をしているわけではなくてもちろん組み合わせて使うことも必要ですしただあの必ず単語に区切っていかないといけないということではなくて、まあ、最初からここからスタートした方がその意味的なコンテキストを早く簡単に捉えられてここからさらに積み上げたらいろいろそのまあクリエイティブなアプリケーションスマートなアプリケーションができるというようなところが ANO のまあ目指すところでございますので、まあ、ぜひあのパートナー様、えー、ANO 様こういう技術あの昨日発表しましたのであの今後またご興味があればです、ね、ご説明の機会をいただければと思います。あのデモは以上でございます。Thank you, Horita-san. So, as, as, I,、uh, as he explained, this is, a, this is a demonstration that shows how, the, how you can start using INO, but obviously it starts getting interesting if you can have the same sort of information with your, with your patient's history,、uh, with financial news that,、uh, of, the, of the industry that you're watching,、um, and if you can start extracting these and building some more advanced analytical things with it. Um, so, if you're interested in hearing more, Horita san will be giving a, a session in the technical track that goes into some more detail. And obviously, we're happy to talk to you、um, if you have any, any further questions. So, thank you. <laughs>